You're listening to Exposure on Radio X. I'm John Kennedy, and that is Noel Gallagher's High Flying Birds with I'm Not Giving Up Tonight. It is the opening track to the new album, Council Skies, and I'm very pleased to say that Noel is sat opposite me. Hello, Noel. Nice. I'm good. And you? Yeah, I'm fine, thank you. It's good to see you. It's great to have a new record. Um, so, I mean, the fourth studio album, um, what, what did you think you wanted to do? Because in a way, Council Sky is quite different from the last one. Yeah, well, um, when I, I, came, I came back off that. Uh, so I, I did Chasing Yesterday, which I was recording Who Built the Moon concurrently with. And then I, that, that tour went straight into the Who Built the Moon tour. And then off the back of that tour... Um, we did the, we did the. Jo- no, hang on a minute. We did the chasing yesterday tour, which took to twenty seventeen. Then we went into a Joshua Tree thing with you two. Then off the back of that, we went into the Who Built the Moon tour, and then off the back of that, did the rest of the Joshua Tree thing out in um, South America and Australia and stuff. And um, the plan was that we got back on twenty nineteen. I'd spent so much time on the road, I'd kind of had enough of it by then, and. Um, <clears throat> I said, right, I want to take, I want to just take a year out sitting at home doing nothing. Um, and then I began building my studio in 2018. So I want to get the studio finishing up and running. So I wasn't actually planning on having a record out until this time. So I'd not, I'd not lost any ground. But what we didn't know was going to happen was the COVID thing. So um, March 23rd, I'll never forget the day, we went into lockdown 2020 and... You know, I started easing into write, finishing off half-written songs that I'd had. Oh, well, I might as well do them, and and then just started to write. Just started to write since there was nothing else to do really, and I was I didn't I wasn't particularly gonna start writing. Then I was gonna start writing in twenty twenty one, but uh and this particular song, <clears throat> it started off. It, it was it was a track on Who Built the Moon. It was like a, it's a bit more of a trippy instrumental, but the chord progression was still the same didn't have the middle eight and it and it i never got around to writing words for it but both me and david loved it uh it was called daisies at the time and um it was great like an ambient kind of trippy thing a bit like air you know right and um so i i always loved the chord progression and the feel of it so i i, I kind of came up with a melody and eventually wrote the words and then it turned into like a soul kind of thing um, but the but the biggest, the biggest or the most interesting thing, what I find interesting is, I, this should be the closing track on the album, because it, it ends with a lot of hope. You know what I mean? I'm not giving up tonight and all that. And I, for some reason, the track that closes the album, we'll get to that obviously at the end. But um, I didn't feel the track that closes the album was strong enough to open a record with us. It's a big epic kind of affair, and I mm. thought that would be a bit obvious. And uh, I thought I'm Not Giving Up Tonight would be a great way to ease into a new record. But if I could go back now, I'd, I'd have it closing <laughs> I'd have it closing the record, but it was too late to change my mind. But um, I do like that song. It's, uh, it's, it's uh, yeah, it's got a great vibe. There's slightly reminiscent of Buffalo Springfield, and, and um, Gem plays a great guitar part on it. And... Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, I don't know. It's, yeah, yeah, no, it's interesting. I mean, it's got the strings on it. It's got the horns on it. There's a little bit of the gospel choir. And yeah, those are all elements that are through well, the, the record. I guess that the sentiment of it is a song of defiance. You know, I'm not I'm not giving up tonight. And that, you know, obviously re- writing these things in, in lockdown, there was a bit there was a bit of that in uh, in, a, in a lot of the songs. Um, but, yeah, it's a grand, it kind of sets it up perfectly because it's a, it's, a, it's a grand kind of opening, but it's, it's a bit laid back as well. It's not sound great in the summer. Yeah, 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 yeah totally. Um, but, but it's interesting because there are some elements on this record that it seems as if maybe that was the vision. You're going to bring in the strings. You're going to have horns on it. Was that always the case or did you just think no, of that not, afterwards? No, not initially. I didn't have, going into writing this record, I didn't have an idea what I wanted to do. Because initially me and David were going to make another record. Right. So and this is David Holmes, just in case anybody. Oh yeah, sorry, yeah. Me and me and David Holmes are going to make another record, and um, you know the pandemic got in the way, and by the time I'd already written all these songs, and he doesn't like me to write without without him in the studio, kind of thing. So um, we will make another record eventually, I think. Coming up, so when it was decided, when I decided I'm going to make this record, I just wanted it to be a reaction to that one, which was all inspiration and haphazard and a bit collages and 
French girls and you know scissors and all that kind yeah. of. Yeah. Uh, and and this one I wrote on the acoustic guitar, you know. But the the strings thing didn't really come into play until quite into the recording when you know you just try it with the, the technology you now. You've got these string sounds that, that sound like you know proper orchestras and I'm putting them on. And I was like. Oh, that's gonna sound amazing! And then we decided to do real strings at Abbey Road, and yeah, but it wasn't that the the um, the grandiose element of it wasn't a first because they're, because they're written home on a, at home and on acoustic. They were all quite intimate. But as we got in the studio, it became clearer that these were going to work as big kind of sonic statements as well. So I'm I'm pretty pleased that we that we kind of we beefed it up a bit. Yeah, yeah, totally. And it's nice to go from that that intimate personal thing, which is just you and your acoustic guitar, and then and then build it up. From yeah. There. Well, this song in particular has got a nice a, a nice arc to it. If it had a shape, it'd have a, a, a nice arc. It starts off, you know, quite intimate, and then it and then it builds and builds and builds and builds, and it's it's one of my favourites. Uh, we've been rehearsing it for a bit. It's not going to cut it live. I don't think. We, <laughs> yeah. Well, one, you know, with songs like that you have to show an amazing amount of restraint to kind of to sing it i i don't tend to have that in my gigs it's all a bit you know but um it's a beautiful tune though yeah totally pretty boy is the next song the first single from the album it features johnny Marr, i understand yeah well it's a bit of an anomaly on the record which the kind of the the wind up merchant in me was like thinking, well, it's got not this has got nothing to do with the record apart from the fact that it's a great tune. And I thought, yeah, when people hear it for the first time, the, the they won't like the drum machine. And so I was like, let's put it out then, you know. <laughs> and uh, so, but again, that was written at home on an acoustic guitar late at night, and. Um, you know, it's the melody is very reminiscent of of a Bowie thing, and it then it started to sound like the Cure, and uh, yeah, and I was always going to ask Johnny to play on it, and uh, you know, he came down. Obviously, we've spoke about Johnny before, but he, he he came down. He doesn't like to hear the tracks before he comes to the studio, so he comes down. He sets his gear up and straps his guitar on. And then he says, "Right, let's hear it," you know, and he, he's hearing it for the first time, and he's immediately playing along with it. But he didn't the the motif thing that he plays. He didn't get it. He didn't get it straight away, which is something that he usually does. He um it took him a while, but once he hit on it, I mean, I was blown away by it because the song it gets to a point and then it just stays there, and it needed some kind of light and shade and a, something interesting, something that I'm not capable of on the guitar. And um, when he hit that thing, I was like, wow, well, that guy, you know, he's just he just, he's just got it, you know what I mean? And um. So then, as the song progresses and it starts to sound like the Cure, one of those mad nights where you just think, "Wonder, when does Robert Smith do remixes?" And it, and of course, in the music business, you're only two degrees of separation away from anyone, so you always know someone who knows someone, you know, who not. So I end up getting his email, and you, you know. Put the like. Would he be? Would he be receptive to receiving an email from I? You know, and I thought he'd. Well, I thought he'd be like, yeah, well, a guy from Oasis. I don't think so. You know, you couldn't get two more polar opposites in the Oasis and the Cure, right? So, <clears throat> but you must have met. No, I've never met him. Wow, right. I've never met him. And I and I've always been a huge. I love his songs, and I every time I would get to somewhere, a festival, or, I mean, oh, the Cure played last night. I'd always miss them. And I did get to see them at Ross Kilda in uh, 2018, and they let me stand on the side of the stage because they never let anyone. And uh, I thought it was amazing, but I never got to meet him. Anyway, I sent him this email and said, I'm doing this track, and I think it sounds like The the, the Cure. And and uh, he texted back, you know, send me the track. And I was, anyway... He sent me another email. I've got the track and I love it and I'll, and I'll do it. And I was like, wow, this is amazing. Well, if I thought it sounded like The Cure when I sent it to him, when it, when it, when it come back, we're like, well, well, okay, now that sounds like The Cure. And it wasn't until I was playing it to someone in the studio and they'd said, wow, it's like, it's like a moment in music. There's like Robert Smith's playing on it, one of The Cure. Johnny's playing on it, one of The Smiths. And you're playing on it, one of Oasis. And I was like, you know, the the... 
the triad you never thought you needed until you heard it. But it was a great, great moment. And I've subsequently met him. And he's a really funny, he's a really funny, I didn't know he's from the North, which, um, yeah, he's from Blackpool. But his family are, because he grew up in Sussex, didn't he? I just, somebody told me, I don't know, I mean, yeah. I didn't, I've not yeah. gone into it. Somebody told me he's from Blackpool. I think it was John Robert told me he's from Blackpool. You can't trust that John Rob. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, I've kind of met him briefly, and uh, I mean, I've always been an admirer of his tunes. Always, I mean, I vividly remember buying, standing on a beach there and see the singles album in HMV in Manchester. I've still got it, and I still listen to it. You know, those that run of singles they had in that period was just, I mean, you know, yeah. I mean, he's, he's got it. And uh, and I went to see them last Christmas at Wembley, and they're just, you know, they've got. You know, they're one of those great British bands that have got that canon of songs to call on. And I love the way they come on and do a, a new eight-minute instrumental. <laughs> I love that. The, the, the perverse side of my nature is like, I like that, you know, because people come on and do Love Cats, and that's all the back end of the show, and it's amazing, and he's brilliant. And, um, yeah, and, and yeah, Pretty Boy is just, it's just, it's just a great vibe, you know. And it was the first song that I... So first song that I've completed and the first one that I demoed, so it was fitting that it was the first one that came out. Yeah. And then I remember saying the guy was doing the video, said, What well, give me a point? And I just said, Oh, just boys in makeup. And he said, All right. So he sends me this the video. And I was like, Oh my god. <laughs> I was like, Wow. This is gonna freak some poor flowers out. And I was like, he said, Is it too much? And I was like, No, it's not enough, you know. And uh <laughs> It was great, but I do love it. Uh, and, and, and funnily enough, it does sound good live. Yeah, mm. excellent. So you've already got this one worked out. And uh, on the record, so we've got the Robert Smith remix. Is Robert on the tune on the on the album as well? No, no, no. no. He's, uh, yeah. he's, he's he's, he's he remix. plays guitar yeah. on the remix. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, sounds like all the Cure on the. Re- sounds like the Cure doing you know, playing yeah. the backing track. Yeah. It's amazing though. Um, but uh, no, I'd love to get I'd love to get him on a on a tune. I'd love to. I mean, he's got. He's got that thing, you know. This one of those guys. He's got, you know, like Johnny's got this thing. This the most melodic guitarist I've ever heard in my entire life can make a guitar not sonically sound like a string section, but can can do these things that no one else can do. And Robert Smith's got that thing when he plays his baritone. There's nothing quite like it, you know. It's he's like he's he's like a hybrid of Peter Hook and I don't know. He's I mean he's he's something else for sure. Dead to the World is the third song on the album. I've read somewhere that you said this is your favourite. Yeah. Is that true? Yeah, it's one of my favourites I've ever written. I don't think I'll ever get bored of that song. It's, to me, it's, in speaking of my solo thing, it's up there with Riverman, which is my favourite song I'd ever recorded until this. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, I, so I'm in... With this song, my studio's been completed by this point and i was just we we're still we were still in the pandemic but we were allowed we were allowed, some ludicrous rule we we're allowed to mix with another person that you'd know you know whatever and i was in the studio with my guy and um i just, i the two chords that go round around the song i never played chords like that before and i i think i hit them by accident and it kind of stopped me in my tracks and i got callum my studio engineer the guy that mixed it just said just record this and i played the two chords round and round and didn't didn't think anything of it and anyway kind of went home that night and it just fell out of the sky it was just like you know it's one of those magic moments like you you get them as a songwriter from time to time where you're not looking for it it finds you you know and um even the words were quite quick and i was going through a bit of a turbulent time at home and it all just seemed to come out in that song and there's one line in the song that I'd add as a as a lyric for for a while, which I, when I go on to I stay in this particular hotel in Buenos Aires in Argentina, and uh, these kids will always they'll take shifts and they they stay there 24 hours a day singing all my songs, and there's one night up late like jet lag and you could hear them kind of in the car park and they're singing some songs and getting all the words wrong, and I'm <laughs> kind of there like. And uh, I think I had a guitar, and I, the, the, the lyric card is like, you know, I'm going to write you a song. It won't take me long, and you know, you can you can learn all the words, but you'll still get them wrong. And 
I don't know why it ended up on Dead to the World. You like if you change all the words, you'll still you'll still get them wrong. Maybe it kind of the shape of it was better. But um, I was thinking of those kids when I wrote that line. But the song itself, when it gets to the chorus, it was the one song, not the one, but it was one of the big ones where people, when they came down to the studio, like when Rosie came, the string arranger, and it got to the chorus, you know, it's doing the thing, it's in the verse, and then everyone's like, oh, it's really beautiful. Then when it gets to the chorus, even I, when I hit on that chorus, was like, oh my, wow, well, that's, this is, you know, this is incredible. And... um it's a beautiful, beautiful song. It really is. You yeah, know, it, it sounds so, so lush. Yeah. Well, you know, I've been saying it in interviews, but one of the great privileges of a musician's life is to be able to go into Abbey Road and do real strings and do it in studio too. And that studio is made for strings. It sounds so majestic. And um, the string arranger that I've used for years now called Rosie Danvers Um she just gets my stuff, you know. I don't. I, maybe it's because she's a. Maybe it's because she's a woman, and it's, it's she. You know, my stuff is quite romantic and a bit less laddish. Um, but I didn't hear the string arrangement until you know we all we all got in Abbey Road and there's thirty old people there and it's like okay we're gonna do the run through and then when she came in it was like oh wow it's just you know it's a really brilliant moments in your musical kind of life where you just you know wow this is going to be great um, so yeah I mean it sounds lost but to be honest there's not a great deal on it there's a guitar and a bass and there's, there's one guitar one bass there's a little girl backing singer thing my backing singers and the rest is all strings you know so it's it's a song that really lets all the people who play on it lets it breathe anyway and it's it's kind of it says it all it's just you know it's just one of those songs. Yeah, it's interesting hearing your voice on this song as well because it's a, a new voice, I think. It's, you seem to be singing in a higher register. Uh, well, I, I mean, I, yeah, I got up there in uh, in Importance of Being Idle and some right. songs. Yeah. But again, it's another one that I don't think I'll perform it live because it it would require too much... I mean, I remember singing it in the studio and it it was it was a tough one to sing... You know, and it wasn't something that was just bashed down and three or four takes or whatever. It was something that was constructed line by line. And I don't think I'd be able to pull it off like live, which is a shame. But um, I wouldn't be able to do it justice. I wouldn't want to murder it, you know. Uh, would it sound great in a field on a Thursday? I don't know. You could take your car <laughs> and crank well, up they, the yeah, stereo. Well, yeah, they can just, you know, you can listen to it on the way home. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Um, Open the door, see what you find is the next song. Yeah. Well, th this is, I mean, it's great. It starts off like when we're playing it live, just, you know, when Chris plays the drum beat, you just want to go into supersonic. <laughs> right. Uh, and, uh, but this is one of the, I, there, was a, there was a lot of open the door lyrics on this record because of being in isolation. There was a lot of that. Which I had to go back and rewrite a little bit because it was a bit. It was like oh, it's become a lockdown album. Um, so when I was this one will be the one that people before they go to the chorus, people will be like, "Well, a child could write that." You know, it's just like it's the three basic chords and a basic melody, and it's. But the chorus, when when we did it in the studio and, and the and the backing singers come in and all that. It's just pure sunshine. It's just so uplifting. And I'd had that string riff. The top line string riff is mine, which I'd had for ages. And I'd tried to kind of shoe on it into a few things down the years. And it never quite worked. And it worked for this song. And it was, oh, thank God I've got that out of my system. And the strings, are, it sounds like, you know, I mean, it sounds like every great single from the 60s you know it sounds like the kinks and the left bank and you know uh small fit i mean it sounds it sounds like everybody and uh it wasn't intentional but the song that i played to people is just like well that's just that's just sunshine in a bag you know what i mean it's like you can't argue with it and uh yes yeah, a great throwaway majestic one of those majestic kind of pop singles it is going to be the next single i think right so. i love those chimes are they chimes what, what that, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, the tubular bells. Yes. Yeah, it's off. Uh, it's off. It's off the Mellotron. Yeah, um, 
and they're great because they're slightly out of tune as well, which all things on the Mellotron are. Um, but the the uh, the backing vocals are really, really great. And John, there's another one Johnny plays on. Uh, you know, he's got this thing right where the sec where it comes to the the solo section. I always felt it needed a guitar solo or something. And he he does a solo without playing a solo. He just does this thing where he, you know, dun, 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 dun. it sounds like the Lars at that point, you know. And uh, you know, I'm in awe of that guy, and it's the way that the way that he can just pull these tiny little things out of himself, and it elevates your song from like something that's pretty good to something that's actually really very good indeed, you know, and. Um, yeah, and it's another one we've been playing it live and it, uh, we're rehearsing it live. We haven't done any gigs as yet. Uh, and um, yes, yeah, I, I, when when we're doing the playbacks to people, not not everyone was like, yeah, yeah, it's good, you know. And I was I was like, no, 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 you got no, no, no. This is going to be brilliant live. I'm I can already see geezers with their tops off in the rain, <laughs> having it, you know. And uh, then when the full production thing came along, everyone everyone. We kind of agreed, uh, but it, I, I love it. It's amazing. Trying to find a world that's been and gone. This has a kind of wistful element to it. No. Yeah. Well, I wrote this obviously again in the middle of really the heavy isolation, and I, I done a demo of it, and I thought I'd put it out on YouTube for fans, and I didn't think anything of it really, and then. In the studio, we it was it. It was originally in when we did it in the studio. It was in two parts, right? Because it's called part one. There was a there was a part where the drums came in, and it sounded very reminiscent of "Wish You Were Here" by Pink Floyd, and we had the strings on it, and and it was great, and it and it, and it did have a, a second verse and a bridge and all that kind of thing, and it didn't move me as much as it just been that short with one verse so I kind of went back to that and you know it, it's I it, to my ears anyway it's like a Roger Waters tune off the wall or something and um, yeah it was just you know in there were those days in the lockdown where you were just like well what what is going to what you know what's going to be left after this you know because I was I, I spent most of it out in the country but I would come back into London it was just dead you know, and I had a great night here when uh, I came back into London and it was dead. And I'm not going to lie, I got a bit out of it. And I was just walking around. I was walking around. It was empty. There was, I, the, I think I walked around for a good three or four hours. I seen two policemen and that was it. And they were like, um, what are you doing? And I was like, nothing. And they're like, can we get a picture? I was like, of course <laughs> And... Uh, <laughs> It you didn't was, say uh, I'm, I'm doing my daily exercise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, but it was, it was. I, I'll never forget it. Walking up Regent Street at like four o'clock in the morning, and all the, you know, you never, you have to like London to yourself. Um, it was like a real, you know, and then going, then just thinking, well, actually, what, what is going on here? You know, what's going on? And I don't know. I, I, I was surrounded by a couple of conspiracy theorists. You know, so I'm not really one for watching the news. So I, I I tend to make my own mind up about things and how I feel. And I was just confused about the whole thing as to how it's happened. And, of course, I've got a couple of conspiracy theorists on the firm. And, you know, it's all a Chinese this, that, and you know, and it's made in a lab and blah, blah, blah. And it's all mind control and population. And like, oh, whatever, you know. And, um, yeah, I wrote that song about what, what is life going to be like on the other side of this. And I still don't think we've recovered from it. You know, you still... Somebody will still catch your eye on the street wearing a mask. You're just like, really? Come on. Really? It's over now. And, you know, I've been in... Um, I've been doing a like promotional tour and you go into these radio... Not here so much. These radio... Up in Manchester and up north. All offices empty. Still. Mm. You know, and like, was it... You know... They're not all just coming. They're not took the day off because of me, have they? They're like, no, every, every, everybody works from home. And uh, I remember saying to some of the girls in my office when we were, after the fact, we're coming out of the pandemic, it's going, oh, but you 
can't wait to get back to work. They're like, I really like working from home. And I'm like, really annoys me, do you know what I mean? That life has changed that much and now it's kind of... Guests don't come to the studio anymore on the TV. They're all at dreadful Zoom. Everyone's looking into a fucking iPad. And it, it, you know, I did, I did a, I did a European press tour where I insisted on going to all the countries, and they were, everyone was like, what, "You know, well, just do it on Zoom." And I was like, "I'm not doing it. On, I won't do it." You know, I'm either going to go like I used to, or I'm not going. You know, I'm not doing the interviews. And um, you know, going to Berlin and Paris and Barcelona, all, all, all over Europe was was great and they were really appreciative that someone was actually making the effort to come over you know and uh which might explain a few four-star reviews in there <laughs> <laughs> but um but you are right i mean it's great to have you here in the studio you know it, it's so much better than yeah. talking on zoom i just i just think it's very easy for people now to have that with the internet now which is just a dreadful one of the, the most bar the atomic bomb it's got to be the most dreadful invention that anyone's ever come up with in the history of the world this thing now where people people have just accepted that the, the interaction now takes place on the internet you know and i'm like no what are you what are you what are you doing do you know what i mean it's like if you stop interacting with people it's, it's over you know that's how nonsense conspiracy theories spread that's what i found is uh you know, no matter how wacky you are in your outlook on life and things like a pandemic, you will find on the internet like-minded people who will reinforce your belief system and then they become your little community and then it fuels each other. You know, I had someone telling me that on a particular date that all the people that took the vaccine were going to die and they, and, they, and, they, and they were so sure this was going to happen because somebody said because they work for the CIA or something. And it's like, you know, it's not on April the 1st, is it? You know? <laughs> and they were like, oh, no, you'll see. Yeah, you'll see. You know, and yet here we are, you know. And um, I don't know, it's a crazy time that I just don't think we've recovered for. And it, we were all, as a, as a nation, we were all at odds with each other with Brexit anyway. And with Brexit led into the pandemic and all that thing. And that's what that song was about. But what I do like about that song is it's got a dual meaning as well. It can be about a relationship or or some life or some loss that you've had in life. But I did I, I do feel like we've lost something. Not only as a country, but like a human thing where the, the, it would seem that people only needed a bit of a nudge not to bother interacting with other people. And I don't that, that I, I'm not I'm still not sure. I still haven't been able to work out what that means but i just think people are now so into their own you know this the the phone and the ipad and they've got everything they want is at home i can't wait to get out of the house i can't wait yeah. you know and um yeah they were strange times still are strange times right yeah 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 it's evolving it's changing back a little bit but it a li is, yeah a little but bit it is changed yeah. too as you say yeah 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 it's uh no Nothing is as carefree as it was, you know. Now, now, thank God the masks thing has gone and all that. That at least on the surface you're looking around and, and all that. But it's, um, you know, I, I, I went to L.A. in the middle of it and working on a thing with Dave Sardi that has yet to see the light of day. And I was getting shouted at in the street by Americans, put your mask on, you know, you're so selfish. And I was like... I've Wrote Wonderwall, kiss my arse. <laughs> you know, and uh, yeah, people like being aggressive yeah. in outside restaurants and stuff. And it's like the world lost its mind. Um, and of course, the internet fuels all that, I think. But uh, that's so that's 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 the that's the atmosphere and what that song was written about. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Really interesting. Um, and then you follow it with Easy Now, which has a big guitar solo in it. Yeah. Um, is that you? It's not me, no. Uh, so I'll tell you the story about that guitar solo came to be. That that song... Um, so usually when I'm writing, uh, and if I'm writing songs that start to sound a bit oasis-y, which should be in the Oxford English Dictionary, <laughs> I cannot believe it's not in there. If things start to sound a bit oasis-y, I will always kind of push back against it a bit and think, well, it's just... It. It's just a 50-year-old's version of Supersonic, you know, or it's just a bit, 
it's just another version of rock and roll star or it's just another version of champagne supernova and not as good however writing this song i got to the chorus i was like well hang on a minute you know i think that sounds as good as little by little to me and i kind of persevered with it and i got it over the line and i i thought it's great and then it came to the guitar solo and i i i i've lost my guitar soloing thing now whatever i had it's gone i just i i don't know whether i've got the fear of it but i will pass that duty on to anybody else although i do play one guitar solo on the record um so I happen to have Dave Gilmore's phone number, right? <laughs> so I call Dave Gilmore and I'm like, mate, uh I don't this track and you know, it sounds a bit it sounds a bit like Pink Floyd if I might be as bold as to say that. And he's like, Oh really? And I was like, Yeah, and I was, I was wondering, would you play the guitar solo on it for us? And he was like, Oh well mm, mm. you know, and he hummed and hawed a bit and he was like, Well, Send me the track. So I sent him the track and then a few weeks went past and I was like, can I call him again? And I was like, a bit of that. I thought, fuck it, I'll just call him. So I was like, yes, mate. And he's, what the thing is, and he's like, guitar solo. And he's like, what? And he, you know, started off by saying, I really like the track. I think it's one of the best things you've ever done. He said, but, you know, we were still in the the lockdown-ish kind of thing. I was not back to normal. And he said, he was out in wherever he lives and he's like, you know, I not I don't really have the time and I'm out in the country and da 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 and all that kind of thing. Uh and I was like, Okay, well thanks, you know you know, um I still love you and all that. And uh I go to the studio and say to my uh engineer, co producer, strange boy Stacy, who's a brilliant guitarist, I was like, Today you are gonna be Dave Gilmore. <laughs> and he was like, "What do you mean?" And I was like, "So we set up the the gear, like what he what he would use." And I was like, "Give me comfortably numb, bad boy." And uh, yeah, we got yeah we got there. And he was, you know, it's a great it's a it's one of those great uplifting kind of guitar solos. It's something that I would never come up with. And uh, actually, funny enough, my daughter was she filmed most of the making of the album, and I was watching some of the stuff back recently, and it's it's actually a study in delegating work to everyone but myself. <laughs> I'm kind of of the fact, well, I wrote it. I'm not playing on it. You know, honestly, there's hours of me saying, well, you do it, you know, but it's your record. I'm like, I don't mind that. You play it. Can you play it? You play it. And, uh, but yeah, it's one of those easy now. You could, I could visualize the crowd singing it. And it would have been, it was going to be the first single, which everybody at my label and everyone that heard it was like, "Well, this is this is it." And I was like, "That's just too." Well, I'd be expecting that if I was if I was a fan of me, and that came out, I'd be like, "That's what you expect," you know what I mean? And uh, so that's why I kind of went with Pretty Boy, but it was always going to be the second one, and. It was good that it came out second because all the people that were like, oh my God, I can't believe you've seen the video and all that, that there was just like, but calm down, <laughs> calm down, it's all good. Um, but it's uh, but it's been a tricky one to do live and it's uh, it's only just started to sound good. But yeah, it's, it's, and again, it's got the huge production and the backing singers and all that. And um, it's, it'll, be, it'll be in the set for a long time, I would have thought. Yeah, yeah, and it's got a nice sentiment of, of devotion in a way. No, I'll wait for you. Yeah, it's kind of like a song about friendship. You know, I I was visualizing that thing of if you if you walk the same route to work every day, like most people in London do, and you would maybe see the same girl every day, but you never get to say anything to her. It's kind of like you know, I not I don't know your name or where you are or you know the places that you hide, and uh, yeah, and it's a song about friendship and defiance and yeah, devotion, yeah, and. Um, yeah, one of those. It's kind of like, thank God I still got it. It is Council Skies, the title track of the new album by Noel Gallagher's High Flying Birds. And I understand that the title comes from Pete McKee's book. Yeah. So I'd started writing that in uh, Ibiza, which is where the kind of feel of it must come from, the swing of it. Mm. 
And it wasn't called Council Skies. And I rem I did a little thing recording of it on my phone so I wouldn't forget the melody. And so when I came back, I was noodling around with it at home. And I didn't have any, any other words, but the song had something. And just on my coffee table happened to be the book by Pete McKee called Council Skies. And if none of you have ever seen it or heard of it, he's a he's a painter who paints almost like cartoonish kind of paintings. And he does these illustrations of people on council estates. And he has put together a um, collection of his best work and he's called it Council Skies. And I just happened to, I mean, I do this quite often. I, you know, you look up at a bookshelf and there'll be a title or something and you go, ah, I can... Just, just check if this fella's dead. See if I can steal it. <laughs> um, and uh, Council Skies and underneath the Council... Okay, so I call him. And I've known him for a long time. And uh, he, he was just about to go into hospital to have a, to have a heart bypass. Oh, wow. And, uh, and uh, I said, can I use that title? He's like, yeah, of course you can. And um, so then I, then I had the title of the song and I knew what it was going to be about. It's going to be about... So... so I said to Council Skies, just before we go, what what is it? And he said, Well, it's a it's a when I when I paint the sky blue, it's a particular colour of blue that I mix. It's his own kind of concoction, and I call it Council Skies. And I was like, that's even that's beautiful. And um so uh yeah, I I wrote the song about, you know, what life was like underneath the council skies, and it's about young love on a council estate and trying to find beauty in the in the big city. And uh, yeah, it, it came really quickly after that. And then when I was doing the 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 first interview, I was telling a journalist about the song, and of course he got the wrong end of the stick and thought the album was a concept about you know a journey back through town to Manchester. And I've had to answer a questions about that every day since. Just like it's not about my childhood, it's not about Manchester. It's the song is. You know the 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 rest of it is just it's whatever you want it to be really, but and then so we're recording it and you know Johnny does that thing that Johnny does you know uh, what he said he oh, what did he say I've captured the moment on film I was looking at it last night where he's saying so right he's listening to the song and he's going uh, he said well, I'm sorry about this but I'm gonna I'm gonna have to perform some indie trespassing. <laughs> And I was like, what's that? And he played it. And I was like, do more of that. Do it. Trespass all over it. And he's going, really? And I was like, yes. You know, and he's, uh, yeah, he calls it indie, indie trespassing. <laughs> and uh, yeah, he did, his, he, did, he did the thing. And, you know, again, I said it a million times about him, but he's very understated as a guitarist. I mean, he's amazing. He can do anything. Yet when he comes to play on your tunes, he's not like, stand aside, you know, I'm about to do my thing. He just weaves his way into it, and it just becomes part of the becomes part of the tapestry of the song. And he's uh, he's some boy, I can tell you. But uh, yeah, it's a, it's a good tune. Yeah, yeah, totally. And was he there just for one day then? No, he's there for about so, four yeah. or five, four days. Right. He played on the songs that have ended up on the record. He played on more, but another couple were like, well, you know, we didn't really get that one. Um, no, he's amazing. He come down for three or four days and. I mean, you must have met him down the years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's just one of those guys that, you know, when, when he leaves the room, the energy leaves the room with him, do you know what I mean? And he's he makes you feel good about you. You know, if you were ever in two minds, like, is this song any good? Well, you'll find out in about five minutes, you know. And he's, I mean, I've known him for, I've known him for such a long time. Like, I've known him for 31 years, right? And he's always been like that, you know. And uh, I, do, I do say to him at the end of every session, you know, if you're going to keep picking up the phone when I ring it, I'm going to keep calling you. So don't think this is the end of this. <laughs> and uh, I'm really in a privileged position that he loves what I do and he loves doing it. He's like, no, no, I love it. I love it, you know. And um, yeah, it's just it's great to have him on more than the usual, just like one track, you know what yeah. I mean? And I'd love to, I'd, you know, I'd love to do a full record with him. But we might have... Because he was going off on tour with Blondie at the time, and he think he only had that those few days to spare in between him rehearsing and going off on tour with Blondie, or was it the Killers or something, one of the two? 
and he just had that window but I'd love to do a full record with him where we really constructed it from the bottom up it'd be amazing yeah, um, yeah please make that happen yeah 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 I, you know, we, spoke, we spoke about writing together as well a couple of times down the years but we were so busy doing what we do and I was like look just send me you know if you just send me a riff or, but I know what he's like. He's like me. He'll come up with a great riff and he'll say, I'm not giving it him. <laughs> you know, somebody says to me, yeah, we'll write a song. Send me a chord progression and I'll just do it. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, it'd be amazing. And then you come up with something and go, <laughs> I don't think so, mate. <laughs> <laughs> but um, hopefully one day we get to write something which would be which would be incredible. Um, but yeah, I'd love to, do a, love to do a full record with him where he, where, where he did his thing from top to bottom. It'd be amazing. I think that would be fantastic. I think I really want that to happen. Yeah, You've got to make too. it happen. Yeah. There She Blows is the next song. Um, what can but, you tell us about this? Okay, so um, when I was talking before about being in LA and being shouted at by Americans in the street about the mask, I was, I was over in LA. And uh, so weed is legal right over there. And they have these shops, right? It's called Med Men, right? So you can go and buy, buy, buy it's a very, very, it's, it's, it's almost worth moving to California for. <laughs> and uh, so I'm there for a, a week or 10 days, whatever it was. And uh, I'm working on this thing with Dave Sardi. And then I'm coming back to the hotel at night. And I've got a guitar, obviously. And uh, I've been to Med Men. And now I didn't know this, but you, you, you could get specific kind of highs in the. It's like a science now, right? And you go in these shops, and you, I just thought you could just get high, right? And you go in these shops, and they say, "So what kind of what kind of high are you looking for, sir?" And I'm like, "Well, how many are there?" <laughs> you know, and they're like, "Do you want a do you want a spiritual one, or like a sexual one, or would you like?" I'm like, "And they're like, do you want a, a creative one? Give me some of that." This is no word of a lie. This is weird. Go back to the hotel with this weed, some creative. You know, I'm like, and I'm, you know, I'm cynic. I'm just like, just want to eat loads of crisps and watch the telly and laugh. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> and uh, so I start writing this song, right? And the lyrics are all about some nautical nonsense, right? Like a, it's a guy who's a commander of a ship who's chasing some, looking at the seven seas for some girl. And then, like, this might move here. <laughs> this is outrageous, you know. And when I, I was like, "What's that song about?" And I was like, "Is it the tale of Moby Dick?" I don't know. You know, it's like there she blows, and like, I have no idea. It just dropped out of the sky. And then when we got back to uh, England and did it, it started to sound like the Beatles, you know. And uh, I love the song. It's one of those songs like. Um, Fans, my fans will know this. Like, uh, what's it called? The girl with X-ray eyes. It's one of those. It's not going to be a big tune, or I don't know whether I ever play it live. But it's it's great guitar, kind of. It's a rocker, you know what I mean? And uh, yeah, I yeah, I mean, phew, these Americans are good for something. <laughs> Finally, <laughs> Finally. Um, but I do, I do like it. It's got a great vibe to it. It's got a really, really great vibe to it. And it's a toe tapper. And it's, yeah, it's, it's got a Beatles thing going on, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's excellent. There's a great bass line in it, I think. And, and it's well, quite it, a foot stomping. Yeah, thing. again, that's uh, Paul Stacey, who's, uh, he's, an, he's an amazing guitarist and musician. It's just, it's just a pity that he looks like a dead tramp. <laughs> I can't take him on tour with me. Um, but he's an amazing musician and, you know, when I if I get my guys in to play something and it's not quite right, I can hand him any instrument, and I literally mean any instrument, apart from the drums, but any instrument, and he'll come up with something that just fits. And the, you are you are right; the bass line on that is amazing, and uh, and he plays the guitar solo as well. Brilliant. So he got my money's worth out yeah. of that day. <laughs> Fantastic. Love is a rich man. The ninth song on the album, conjuring up the Stone Roses for me. That's what everyone says. I, yeah. I, do you know what? It never dawned on me until everyone says about the intro, you yeah. know, the beat. But in uh, turn, obviously, that's a Northern course, Soul thing course, or whatever. Of course, of course, of course. Although we should point out they weren't the first people to ever come up with that drum beat. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah. Um, so I wrote that again. Uh, right, uh, it's, funnily enough, I wrote that riding a bike around the around the country lanes of Hampshire. 
I yeah, if you remember just singing, just I'll be your dancing horse if you let me. I'll be the last man standing. I don't know. Who knows? I mean, but it's kind of got a Bowie thing going on in the chorus, and uh, it's got a marimba that follows the vocal melody line, which uh, he does on Blue Jean. It's one of my favourite Bowie songs, so I stole that. And uh, yeah, you know, I mean, I talk about this quite a few times on your show. But if I'm writing a song and it tends to sound like somebody else, most people will just try and make it not sound like that. But I'll go straight into it, no mess. And if it's going to sound like David Bowie, let's go there. You know, so uh, it's a pretty cool, uplifting tune and. Yeah, I, I like the words, and they were all they were all done without writing it. Really, it kind of it kind of came out of nowhere. Uh, and again, that guitar bit that's really difficult to play. That it's Paul Stacey. <laughs> uh, I mean, he's a, you know I can't speak highly enough of him. He's a, an amazing guitarist. And I was saying to him with that one, you know, like I say to him, can you to that you're going to be Dave Gilmore? And they got to the bit, and he was, and I was saying it needs Robert Fripp. That's what it needs. And he was like. <laughs> Pass me that, you know, and uh, yeah, he fripped out, you know what I mean. And uh, I do feel sorry for Gavin when I when I'm going on tour with Gavin, and he's like, he's he's going, oh wow, it's really complicated guitar parts. Like you have got to play like Johnny Marr, you got to play like Dave Gilmore, and you got to play like Robert Fripp and me, you know, and yourself. And uh, but he does uh, Gavin that it does a great job. But um, yeah, it's a great tune. It's a stomper, you know, and yeah. um, it's. It's very reminiscent of 80s period Bowie, I think. Um, and, yeah, that's not a lot I'm going to say about that. It's a great vibe. It's uplifting, but it's kind of quite introspective at the same time. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, and who is playing drums, then, on this record? Uh, so, on... Well, funnily enough, Paul Stacey can play any instrument apart from the drums. He has an identical twin brother, <laughs> identical twin brother, who is, by some distance one of the best session drummers in England, right? He's amazing. He plays on pretty much everything you'll hear on Radio 2. People who aren't bands, he's incredible. So he plays on... Uh, he plays on Pretty Boy... He plays on half, and Chris Sharrock plays on, on the other half. Right, right. Um, and that's purely because Jeremy is quite heavy-handed, and, you know, he's in my first ever touring band. He's quite heavy-handed, and... John Bonham-esque, and if you need the power, he's the guy. Chris is a bit more flowery and a bit more, you know, scouse, and if you need that. So Chris will play and open the door, and I'm not giving up tonight, and think of a number. Um, and there she blows, and Jeremy will, Jeremy will play on the rest. So, I mean, I'm lucky enough to have all these guys who are great, 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 great musicians. And they happen to be really close friends as well, and, and you know, it's not when we're in the studio, it's not like it's just a, a guy that turns up who you don't know, you know what I mean? I've known these guys for 25 years, so we've got there's a band feel to it. And, um, excuse me, and uh, yeah, they're, they're, they're great, great musicians. But I, I, with this record, I'm really glad to get all the band on it for most of it, do you know what I mean? It's I think it was important for them because for... David Holmes didn't want to use anybody on Who Built the Moon. He had all his own guys, and that was it. And that was the concept. And yeah. um, with the other two albums, the band wasn't really settled at that point, so I did it myself. Uh, but with this one, it was always an idea to get everybody involved in it, so they can invest something in it, so they get some reward out of it when we're playing the songs live. So, but it's been a bit of a triumph in that respect. Yeah, yeah, no, that's great. It's interesting now because the next song is Think of a Number, um, which is the closing track that you were kind of referring to earlier on. Um, but but there's there's like the deluxe version of this album, which has all these extra tracks, Amazing, yeah. um, which, and some of which are, should be singles in their own yeah. right. Um, and so it's, it's almost kind of strange closing it here because there's so many other songs that people can get their yeah, heads well, around. Yeah, well, the, so this was written along with There She Blows in LA that, that 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 weekend. Now, you couldn't get two more contrasting songs. One is complete and utter nonsense. And this is, like, quite personal to me, you know. And um, 
Again, it's got like an ashes to ashes kind of Bowie feel to it. I shamelessly ripped off his vibe in the chorus. You know, the forgive my hand. Shamelessly. <laughs> uh, it's a, actually, it's interesting, but the, the rhythm almost is is akin to Ashes to Ashes or yeah, Tomorrow yeah, yeah. Never Knows. It's kind of a mix of the two. Well, when we was doing it with Chris, it was kind of like, I explained to him, XTC kind of on Making Plans for Nides or Ashes to Ashes kind of thing. And he came up with it and that, it's, that's me playing bass. Uh, it's almost like a, a U2 bass line, like for New Year's Day or something. Um, and uh, I love the song. The Now, and it's me playing the guitar, so it's really epic. And so, as mad as this sounds, I didn't think that song was strong enough to open a record with. I liked it, right? And I did, and and something inside of me hung in there with it. And I don't like closing records on a negative kind of uh, almost. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, pessimistic kind of um, feel to it. The last line is like, you know, let's drink to the future, I hope it comes around again. That really should have been the opening track on the album and finished with I'm not giving up tonight, you know. That would have been the journey through the lockdown and isolation and all that. But as that song went on, I was like, just, you know, I just didn't feel it was strong enough. I thought it was just a bit standard I flying birds rock kind of tune. Obviously, when we finish, when I finished it and mastered it, the penny dropped one night at home. I was like, oh, "God, you know." And then you do the frantic, "Can we change it?" And I was like, "No, we pressed up now. What are you doing?" Um, so it really should have been the opening track, but I love the lyrics on it, and they paint a really pessimistic picture of the future, which is what I was feeling at the time. Uh, and yeah, there's some great. The lyrics are really visual, and um, yes, yeah, I mean it's an epic rock tune, and it's it's got the full production, and yeah, really great. I mean, we haven't we didn't get around to rehearsing that one live. I can hope we can do it at some point on the tour, but uh, I think it'll be a lot of people's. It is a lot of people's favourites already. You know, yeah, um, yeah, it's great. No, thanks so much for coming here. Thanks Pleasure. for talking so uh, eloquently oh, thank you. Uh, ab about the new record. It's sounding fantastic. Council Skies is what it's called. And this is the closing song. This is Think of a Number. It's Noel Gallagher's High Flying Birds on Exposure, Radio X. Radio X.